Okay, well, this looks kind of odd. Hold on. Bear with me. Something is very strange. Okay, this is what happens when you have to suddenly switch computers to do stuff. Welcome to technology. Okay. In case you're wondering, you're going to be... I know you can bear with me for a minute. You're going to be... Ready to stream, and then all of a sudden, the software crashes and won't start up again. So just hold on. You're going to get a very exciting view of me. Not here. For a second, while well, I just talk to the camera. Everyone let me know if you can hear me. It seems I'm having... A, uh, not a good start to the morning. Okay, for some reason my video like size is all screwed up in OBS. I just found it frantically switched to um, another computer, uh, which so I just frantically installed OBS on another computer and then had to set up. So it's just set it up from scratch. So all the stuff I usually do is kind of not there anymore. So I don't know why it's not working on my computer. I have to figure that out. Um, it might not like my strange new setup, but anyway. Um, Okay, so, oh good, everyone's here. everyone can hear me, good, everyone's there. So, welcome to Computer Chaos, so I've actually kind of juggling, actually OBS is now on another little computer down here, which I used to use for, um, uh, used to use for actually uh, recording videos. So, oh, camera's over there. Um, so, you're going to have to be, I actually had planned to get up and, uh, you know, cut out all the names for the uh, drawer. And so I thought, no, I'll get up and just check, set up the camera and then do some handy work with some scissors. And, but of course I click on OBS and it doesn't run. So it's been an interesting morning. So I just have some names to cut out while I get started. So first of all, thank you everyone for joining me. Uh, thank you everyone for being a supporter. And so I've got a list of um, uh, supporters here, which I should have been cutting out. And uh, actually interesting, we had a bit of a voice chat on, on so supporters, if you're not a supporter, um, I think most of the people here are supporters this morning. Um, some, I uh, had a nice voice chat yesterday on, a, on my Discord with some people about uh, some good topics to discuss this morning. Now, I won't be able to go for about an hour today um, for various reasons, but uh, there's got an event that was cancelled yesterday that is now happening today. Welcome to uh, Sundays where you can you can never rest. And uh, some thing you, if you haven't already checked it out, uh, a good morning, especially good morning to Kishore Patel, who has written a really cool. Uh, he and his father went to the New Odyssey factory and uh, interviewed uh, Sangar. And I will not even try and pronounce his last name, the the president or the owner of Odyssey. And uh, that's really fantastic to read, um, actually, something about the, their background and the development. Actually, what I went to the Odyssey factory a long time ago, uh, two years ago, and I was going to do a report on it, I've never did, but actually a couple of stuff, but it turned out to be good because I took some photos of stuff that um, he might not have seen, which is like the old military speakers they made. Uh, the meat, not the speakers they made for the military. Uh, those speakers uh, were designed, I think they were designed for training where they need to have produce, output a really, really loud amount of sound. So, you know, the only way to output a lot of sound to kind of train soldiers to deal with loud noises is either you fire a lot of ammo at them uh, or that kind of thing and, and you know some some training is done live that way I gather or you um, put really huge speakers out there and, and make a lot of noise now I don't know the fine details of that but I gather they were doing that before they were making headphones and then of course you got the whole story about the planar headphones which they made a prototype uh, which if you look really carefully there's an Odyssey LCD one if you look around you'll see photos of it uh, floating around Headfire where they had them at the meet and um, that eventually led to the LCD2 and and uh, what we have today you know big planar revolution with everyone and a lot of people making planers and now even planar in-ear monitors so that was a bit of interesting random history which I'm just speaking to while I, I cut out bits of paper and sorry if I'm not scared, staring at the chat as well um, some interesting stuff that's come up before I do the Q&A is uh, that I'll be talking about uh, DAX uh, you know, like uh, there's a, a lot of revival and, and ladder decks, R two R decks, and uh, you know, there's some some people seem to, there's someone brought up a list of um, uh, someone's preferred deck list, and the top of the line, their preferred decks, 
which were all really, really expensive, high-end models for the most part, and from the Dave upwards kind of thing. Uh, and uh, they preferred some, a really obscure, top, really obscure hand-built uh, 120 kilo ladder deck is the best they'd ever heard. We actually used old, um, I think it was AD 1965 chips, which are considered like by the, the people who've been around a long time, the, kind of the best deck that was, the best uh, deck chip that was ever made. Um, and they could still show up kind of online uh, on eBay, like people make, you can buy these uh, like cheap versions of the, like a uh, cheap non oversampling decks. So bear with me while the stuff is, stuff I would have done before, I could not do. I have to do now. So, the good old basket. Okay, right. So, what I'm going to do this morning, excuse the chaos, um, what would a live stream be without complete chaos? Um, was, and then remember where I put it. Okay, so today's, this month's little gadget is. Trelucent Audio, and I bet a lot of people haven't heard of Trelucent Audio. So interesting, started by, started by a guy called Gavin, who's a retired banker who lives in Hong Kong. Uh, he's kind of flopped, disappeared out of the game now, and he made some really cool IEMs, and they were, came across, uh, they were started because he wanted some IEMs to, um, uh, he wants some new IEMs to reproduce kind of the sound that he got out of his, his big, very, very, very expensive high-end speakers. And I mean, well, you know, uh, when he was traveling, you know, he wanted something that was kind of close to it, and there was nothing quite like that on the market. So he came up with the OnePlus 2 with some help from other people, because um, obviously he's not an, uh, a designer or anything like that. He worked in conjunction with um, uh, other people who uh, who made IEMs, and uh, it was a it was a balanced armature, two balanced armatures with a dynamic driver. Sound familiar? Well, it's been widely copied. The design, you know, what have I got? I've got FH5s floating around here. Actually, they're in my bag at the moment, the FIO FH5, which are coming up soon. And, uh, you know, the, the kind of idea has been around for a while now, and they're actually pretty good sounding IEMs, and they're very expensive. Actually, the, the silver gold cable he, he, um, he sold was actually more expensive than the IEMs themselves. But anyway, he made a little portable amp called uh, the, let's see if I can open this without like dropping everything on the floor. Uh, it should be all right. It's all encased in foam. Um, so he had this little portable amp he made, and he gave me one long time ago. And it comes with not very exciting. You know, little, it's only a little cable. So it's an old school amp. It's nine volts. It actually has a very basic DAC inside too. So it's actually got digital input uh, on the back, which I don't know how well you can see on the camera because the camera has only got locked focus at the moment. Um, but it has analog and digital input. And actually, if you it hasn't got the 9 volt battery it originally came with, but um, it just needs a 9 volt battery. You know, unscrew, open up the case and pop that in there. Kind of a bit of a funky fit, but it actually was not a bad little portable amp. So that's what I'm giving away this morning. And um, so the, the names of all my current uh, patrons now, because the patron system is updated to once you once you once you subscribe, uh, you get charged immediately. So anyone who's up to today who has um, paid, you know, uh, pledged at least two dollars or more is in this basket and so that then when i draw your name i'll send you a message on patreon and if you want the item you can just pay for the shipping which is usually around about 20 bucks to most places and if not i'll just draw another name out of the hat okay so i think we're i don't know how well we're shuffled there but let's try a drawing a name who's going to come out I didn't fold the pieces, of, I didn't use long folded pieces of paper this morning, so grabbing them is actually hard. Oh, that's really funny. You're going to really laugh at who this is. So, Space Robot. There we go. We all know who you are. Everyone knows who you are. So, what a lovely coincidence. No, I really like, that's really cool. No, I have no idea. You can see all the, oh, you can't see all the names in there, clearly. They're all different. But, um, that's just really cool. I mean, considering you pledged a lot, you really deserve something at least, so... Congratulations, if you want a little small portable ramp. Um, so, I thought that's, that's really cool. Um, some people, some of you have been extremely generous, and that's just really amazing that any people could be so generous to uh, support me that way. So, you know, I'm kind of blown away by it. But, uh, so I'll just keep plodding on. And uh, I'll contact you about this if you're, uh, you're around this morning. I don't know if I can't see your name in the chat, but um, I'll put that aside. Next, we have questions. Um, so, I will answer chat questions 
after I've done the questions and answer, which you will see in the description, <clears throat> which I should have pasted everyone's, everyone's question in there by now. Um, so we had some cool questions at this time. He, first, we're going to start with Base on Mars, who asked, as a relative newcomer to the scene and having never attended any shows or meets, it seems like it would be overwhelming being presented with a chance to listen to 20 plus headphones and as many DAC amps and DACs. And of course, we all like to write long and overwhelming sentences, as do I. Um, can you share any tips on preparing to go one to one on how to get the best out of the, out of the listening experience? Uh, yes. Uh, I usually take, it varied over the years, it used to be CD, actually it's still worth taking a burn CD. You'll get someone, some company to meet who still uses a CD transport. I mean, if, say, Cord were there, they still have a Blue 2 there, so it's kind of is simpler. I mean, although it has USB input. Um, I take a phone. Um, now I take, um, it kind of actually doesn't sound as good Strangely, for someone, you get sound deterioration with it if you use the long version. But I have this Mego cable, which is actually lightning to micro USB. Um, I take a uh, what else do I take? Micro SD cards formatted in FAT32. You've got to reformat them, otherwise, because a lot of stuff still doesn't support XFAT, which is crazy. Um, so I take a card with XFAT, usually a 64 to 200, somewhere around that mark, loaded up with the stuff I want to try out, um, which is usually Chesky binaural and maybe some Decca recordings, some violin and uh, some piano uh, for the stuff that I want to test, you know, how good is the digital, uh, which is kind of everything's pretty good these days. And then I have other variety of music that I like listening to, which I've listened to a lot, so I kind of get an idea how it is uh, by my impressions from it. Uh, I take usually a Chord Mojo, uh, now Hugo 2, um, and I take, uh, you know, I don't usually need to take RCA cables. Um, I usually take, you know, a mini to RCA cable, you know, mini to mini. Basically, I assume that someone's going to have a rig and I can plug stuff into it, or they have a DAP and I can put my own card in, or something like that. Generally, um, I'm going to have an analog or digital input if I'm lucky. And then I will be able to listen to my own music because sometimes the distributors say, no, you can't plug in your own stuff. And that really pisses me off uh, because I want to listen to a pair of headphones and they have some DAC there, which I don't like. Um, no name shall be mentioned. I, um, there's a particular distributor in question who did that as a friend and I'll talk to him personally about it. Um, and uh, so it's kind of really irritating to not be able to at least use my own music and they'll have a server there and they'll have music and they'll have like maybe, if I'm lucky, they have probably have take five and if I'm not lucky, I, there was a, like a twenty thirty thousand dollars $30,000 setup once which had absolutely nothing I liked on it. Which, no, actually there's a $100,000 setup I had nothing I liked on it either. So if you can, um, but most like things like can jams, you should be able to plug your stuff into most things. Um, Tokyo was a bit strange. Um, so we usually we have trouble. Uh, an optical cable, if I have a DAP, I usually take an AK380 um, because it has uh, APTX, APTX HD output, so if I'm testing Bluetooth headphones. Um, it's not LDAC, I think I'll probably take something with LDAC in the future. So it's kind of, I decide what I, you know, that's the variety of things I take. So it's quite a pain in the you always come across one situation where you can't use your preferred thing. Um, either the manufacturer says, no, you can't, or uh, uh, it's just you have something that's not compatible, but it's pretty rare. Anyway, uh, that was kind of what I take. Um, I sometimes used to take some closed back, I used to try and find some closed back headphones to take, and that's pretty hard because I want to hear, I want something that's like a Focal Utopia, but closed back. That's just not going to happen. Um, so actually, lucky, I'm lucky now in the Tokyo shows, I stay in the same hotel. Um, sort of like a lot of people do with CanJam and then if a manufacturer has something I'm really keen to try because it's two days I will say can I borrow this overnight and if I'm lucky they'll let me borrow it overnight in the hotel room and have a listen the problem is of course you go out socializing you're out to like 11 or midnight so it's kind of doesn't happen but anyway or I just get up stupidly early and listen um, early stacks impressions um, I just did last night I just did uh, Utopia from Studio 6 uh, versus stacks from stacks from stacks um, and uh, it's better. The stacks is better. 
Um, I think the Utopia is the best actually straight out of the Hugo 2 now. I haven't uh, semi decent. I've been playing around different cables. Um, and uh, it's pretty close if I go Hugo directly to Hugo 2 directly to Utopia. So, but I think the stacks can be sort of wider sounding and the, the, the Utopias can be feel a bit more closed in. Uh, I don't know if it's just the amp. Maybe it is. I'm sure that the stacks mafia will say it's the amp. Is that it's not, it's very hard to say it's more detailed. I'll tell you something, uh, the SR009S, I've already said it if you see my Tokyo show reports, uh, it sounds like, um, imagine the new uh, Audio-Technica ADX5000. Now the ADX5000 sounds like an AD2000, but really high end, actually genuinely high end this time. Uh, the AD2000s are like a pair of Grados, but comfortable. They're like super in your face mids. Um, they're really mid, kind of mid forward, but they're super rock out cans. The ADX5000 take that to a high end and they'll do bass slam as well. So imagine that they mated with a pair of SR009s and you have the SR009S. They're kind of like, imagine the stacks that are really in your face, really rock out and have bass slam. And Electrostack bass slam is like the weirdest thing ever. It is like, it is so good, but it's like, this doesn't seem possible. Um, it's really, really weird. Uh, so it really reaches down to the low notes and hearing it so super, super, super precisely is kind of, almost freakish uh it's it's freakishly great so um uh considering that's probably worth this system is probably worth more than my car currently is it's like mm, that's not going to happen um but i swore off stacks you know and no one's caught up yet which is amazing they've actually exceeded themselves with this so that's pretty cool um okay we have stream health problems Hold on just a sec. Something's going funny with the streaming. What's with this? Why is it... Com I've got stream health. Check resolution. <laughs> That's bizarre. Hold on while I work out why something is going odd. It says the stream resolution is wrong. And the problem is, I don't know why this is being silly. Okay. This is really odd. It's giving really, really odd. Can you all hear me okay? Okay, if it's fine there, I'll just leave it. It's just, for some reason, YouTube's saying that my stream resolution is not normal. And it's because I've probably just set up uh, OBS from scratch on another computer that it's kind of being odd. So we'll just leave it at that. If it's all streaming fine, then I'll leave it. Okay. Um, hi, Dan and Springbay, and welcome. So next question, I'll go on to the... Um, Question number three from Drunk Saru. Who, did I see him online? I did, he's here. Um, says, do you think race and location where you were raised or grew up can influence your hearing ability? And then he goes on to talk about like different people, different preferences, um, about how loud people listen, the kind of music. Yeah, um, I always tend to think that Chinese gear is geared towards listening to classical Chinese, you know, music for some reason, I don't know why. I guess because maybe, you know, uh, you know, I mean, like British people will test with like opera and, and, you know, old school, you know, Western classical. And I guess Chinese people who are older engineers, I would guess tested with Chinese classical, I guess. Um, I don't know what people listen to in China. Uh, Japan, of course, you know, uh, you know, Japanese have their own preferences too. I think, well, we do know that like ears from different, different regions, there's some been discussion before about people's ears being different sizes and stuff like that. And maybe there's an effect on pitch, which it probably is. I mean, everyone, if you've heard the story, everyone has a null in their hearing between about eight to 10 K. So with, uh, if you have a pair of, some people will find bare dynamic headphones super, super bright because they usually have a peak around say nine K or 10 K. But if someone has a null where that peak is, they might find them uh, not too, they might find them about right. So uh, there's some discussion on that and uh, I really need to find out more about it. Uh, someone else is supposed to post about it and I was, wasn't supposed to 
ages ago said they were going to post about it in like with proper background with a proper background but didn't happen so um but that's just kind of really interesting how our ears are affected by different sounds ah uh, you know the the old trick you know if you shut one eye and hold your finger in front of your face and move it to the side you'll get a blind you've got a blind spot and it's just on like directly opposite the optic nerve well it's the same thing your hearing has a kind of blind blind spot as well so yeah um there seems to be cultural preferences for sure uh but uh you know i can't think off the top of my head uh which countries and what i mean there was always like the thing about british hi-fi and american hi-fi and different tunings too so i think there's always been something around about what people prefer um what do i think of it like about the sound aware p1 that's from space robot so the sound aware p1 um is a little bit kind of sweeter sounding than the Master 9. Like for listening preference, it's the nicest to listen with. So if I go straight from, say, the Yggdrasil to the SoundAware P1, that's a really nice combo. Uh, whereas the Master 9 can be a bit too kind of, that's just it. Um, so the only problem is it's not got as good a power supply as the Master 9, so that if you plug it directly into the wall versus plug it into my power, power plant Premier power conditioner, there will be a slight difference. So that's about it. Um, so in my system, it works really, really well. And you know, the SoundAware specifically said, use a nice silver power cord. And it's like, I'm not gonna spend like an extortionate amount of money on a silver power cord. No, <laughs> I'll just use the ones I have, uh, which are still like decent, but DIY with rhodium plugs um, for the curious. Um, and uh, a comparison between the IDSD Pro and R2R7 would be great. Um, I'd probably say, well, the IDSD is kind of, it depends on what filter settings you set or whether you use tube mode or whatever. It can sound slightly warmer. Uh, actually, the non-oversampling mode isn't really that super warm, not like the uh, uh, R2R7, but it's a little bit narrower, uh, you know, less clear versus the transient line filter, which is more Court Hugo-like, which is kind of super precise. And then you've got that slightly euphoric DSD upsampling mode. Um, and... Uh, it's actually kind of more the Pro IDSD to me. It is more Hugo or Hugo, Hugo two like in its uh, kind of presentation, with the option of some euphoria, a uh, little bit of you know kind of de uh, softness uh, which you can apply various tube or other filter settings. So that's about it. Um, but otherwise, it's actually a really nice deck. Um, I was listening with it last night, and I was just switching between decks, and it's getting to the point you know like through the amps where I can't tell the difference anyway. Um, I think I'd have to drag out like you know, the the Decca recordings of, you know, someone playing a violin right up in front of the mic to try and pick stuff out, but it's kind of getting ready to the point where I don't care. Um, but the SoundAware P1 is just, I've actually got to put it back on here somewhere. I've got things are floating around a lot. Uh, it's actually just really nice. That slight sense, it's not probably the most perfect amp, but it hits the spot that's spot on exactly between sounding nice and euphoric versus sounding very clear and precise. And it's probably not quite a, a fraction behind in detail versus the Master 9, but you know, I'd rather listen with it than the Master 9 most of the time. So it's not that the Master 9 isn't a good amp, it's like it's too perfect. Um, a comparison between, yeah, okay, we got that. Um, what do you think of the Pentacon connector? So the Pentacon connector was an interesting one. It was shown to me first by uh, now Tsunoda of Sony, who's actually retired now. Um, he, well, he hasn't retired so much as left Sony. He, um, so the idea is to get rid of this 4.4 millimeter nonsense, get rid of all the different standards for balanced, and just have one connector. So uh, it's a little bit big. Obviously, it's being bigger than 3.5 millimeter. It's going to be a little bit bulky for portable, ideally. Uh, but it has being 4.4 millimeter. The problem with say 2.5 millimeter is it's based around a standard that is extremely loose and is used for things that is not that are not important. Uh, there are all sorts of connection issues. It's it's weak. It has bad contact area. You know, it has a host of problems. Uh, four point four millimeter is big enough to have a good contact area while not being too big. Uh, it 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 has five connectors, so they can have it can have balanced. Usually has four. Uh, it's technically it's supposed to have at least five. You're supposed to have a ground reference for the balanced. No ground reference means you're actually not using balanced technically. Um, so actually, our four pin XLR is technically bad. Uh, actually, one well, funny thing, if you see um, Lake People, uh, what's their brand name? Uh, in Germany, originally when they came up with their balanced amp, they had a five pin XLR until everyone shouted at them, nobody uses that, don't even get started. 
and a 5-pin XLR would have been better than a 4-pin XLR, but the 4-pin XLR was started by AKG with the AKG um, K1000s when they used the, spe the speaker adapter, it was plugged into a speaker adapter because their K1000s were originally supposed to be plugged into speaker outputs. Um, so that's where that trend started, and they had an amp with a 4-pin XLR socket on it, so that's where that came from. Um, and of course, no ground reference. So that was, you know, so to be technically correct, you can have that Pentacol connector, which can have unbalanced, balanced, whatever you like. And then hopefully, I reckon in the future, if you had like 3.5 millimeter and 4.4 millimeter and everything else pissed off, that would be perfect. That's my impression, that's my ideal. So I'm bugging the crap out of every manufacturer, put 4.4 millimeter on your products. Um, the problem is now there are no chassis mount 4.4 millimeter connectors. They're all surface mount and designed for portability. And so that means now I have to go and bug people like Furitech and whoever, can you make someone, make a, make a, a proper jack for these things? Uh, I don't know anyone at Nutrick, unfortunately, which is, uh, which is sad. Um, but uh, if someone can, act, there are, probably are other connectors, but they're probably made in China and they're probably, God only knows what quality. So um, that's something, it, once the chassis connectors start appearing, I think that things will start moving on. Anyhow, uh, hopefully it will replace all these stupid standards and dual 3-pin XLR, oh my God, nobody, please nobody use that. Um, so that's with that. Now I'm gonna scroll back in the chat and see how many questions I've got. Um, let's find out, where, is that some more shit? Yes, I have a lot of shit sitting on my desk. <laughs> Jokes never in end. Um, I've moved back here. So, Leah, Liar3, I don't know how you're supposed to pronounce that. I've never asked. Um, little shit. So this is the start of the $350 rig comparison. Uh, this will go up against NFB, no, R2R11. Um, I just got to get one in. And it'll go up against R2R11 and, and, and Mastrop. Can you, hold on. Can you see Mastrop on the desk? Yes, you can. Here we go. The start of Mastrop. Um, I'm waiting to see if I can get a, one of the ladder decks over. Um, this is a nice little amp, actually. I'm, I've got, I've even got. I asked them to send over a pair of the HD6XX, which is interesting. And this is a good periapt cable, which I did do. The, which they sent me one over as well, which is really cool. Not more. Mastrop didn't periapt did it way back. This nice funky blue, cheap but effective cable for the HD6XX. So that will be the three hundred fifty dollar rig comparison. So it was interesting, you know, with the really really annoying people online we all know who go. You don't need anything more than HD6XX and blah, 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 and anything more expensive is a ripoff and yada, yada, yada. So it was actually interesting to do that and then uh, jump up to the Focal, uh, Mastrop Focal LX, which are sitting, you can just see them behind my head, uh, and uh, actually hear what all these people have been talking about for months and months and months. And considering like tons of people, like I think the most common question I hear is like, uh, is XYZ headphones uh, better than HD6XX? Is, is it worth upgrading? So actually plugging plugging them into like the mass drop amp, the shit amps, and then plugging the better headphones in and actually listening to the difference and going, oh, so this is what people have been hearing all this time that people have been talking about. So that's kind of really fascinating. And I have enough tubes to roll around. And, and actually this, so this is a good, the Lyre 3 is a good amp. Um, I've heard some stories that people's headphones have been blown up by it. And the answer, the truth is, people have blown up their own headphones, not doing stuff like hot plugging tubes and uh, uh, tip for everyone who doesn't know. When you're changing a tube, let's assume, pretend this is on. We're cha changing a tube, turn down the volume, unplug your headphones, switch the amp off, wait two minutes at least, and then you have cool stuff like, where's it gone? Oh, I have an oven mitt. We can do the, uh, we can do the joke. No, oh, we can't. So once you've waited your two minutes, get out the oven mitt. This is these are handy, for, uh, honestly handy for changing tubes. Then change your tube, and careful when putting it in, especially if you get new old stock tubes. Um, check that the key, which it, uh, the shows the position. It's not so bad with little tubes because little tubes, which are now we're not floating around, have like a gap in the pins, but things like 6SN7s don't have a gap. And for some reason I've had the odd tube which looks like it has two keys on it, which is really odd. Um, this is powered off, so I can do this. Carefully wiggle the tube out, holding it by the base. A cracked base usually isn't a problem, they're glued on. 
So then just check carefully that the key is, is not damaged because if it is, then there's a risk of putting it in the wrong place. Uh, people who use, this has got Teflon sockets. So, you know, it's, it's nylon with, with very heavy gold plated um, pins and with uh, socket, you know, parts in there. So you cannot screw it up. But some of the, some of the sockets that are out there, it, can, it is possible sometimes to screw stuff up. So that I can just do entirely by feel without checking because I know it's just not gonna go in the wrong way. But I don't know, I haven't checked the sockets in these, but some of the, the uh, ceramic sockets there, it's a little bit easier sometimes to put the, uh, stuff in the wrong way. Uh, so just be careful. And so everyone who's apparently damaged their headphones, it's all been, as far as I'm aware, uh, something that they did. Uh, like the volume was already up high and the headphones are still plugged in. And maybe when they yanked the tube out or plugged it back in, it sent a surge down to the headphones, even if the, even if the thing was off. You should not ever be changing tubes with um, headphones plugged in. And I think, you know, uh, you know, especially some headphones like, uh, you know, if I did it with Sasvaras, they'd probably survive. They'll take up to 15 watts and they're probably not like a surge won't hurt them. But something like Utopias will, you could probably blow the voice coil. I'm guessing anyway. So that's, that's that. Um, about rolling tubes. Uh, what do I think about the RME? Never heard it. Uh, sorry. Uh, here's the thing. Before asking your questions, a good tip. Check the about page on uh, my website and it lists everything I've either have here or have experienced or reviewed. If it's not listed there, um, I have no idea. Um, I mean, if it's something like I review the cheapest audio GD amp and I review the most expensive and I know the mid range is in between, that's about the most I can comment is it'll probably sound somewhere in between. Um, considering the Foco Utopia offered me for a good price, so any alternative options should I consider? Ah. Uh, if it's at a good price, like I bought mine secondhand for twenty five hundred dollars, I'd take that. I mean, you won't lose any money on it because you probably sell them secondhand afterwards for twenty five hundred dollars. Um, so, uh, especially if, if you get it for something like two grand, definitely, uh, because you won't lose your money if you decide you don't like them. Uh, just a good tip: if you like your, if you like strong, um, you know, aftershave lotion and that kind of thing, don't. The thing I hate the most is receiving. Uh, headphones smelling of aftershave. So just uh, if you if you're going to be buying and selling headphones, uh, stay away from the strong deodorants, aftershaves, and don't smoke. Um, anyone? Okay. Let's see. Next questions. Next questions. Next questions. Uh, if there's a buzz, ah, is there a buzz in the mic? It could be because I've next, let me just try something. It's hard to say what's going on around here. There was a buzz, I was recording something yesterday for someone and there's a buzz. So if there's a buzz, I just removed the iPad that was next to the mic. Um, it's, everything should be fine. Like nothing should be touching anything, but there's, there's so much gear around here. Buzzes just appear everywhere and are tracking them down is a nightmare. Um, okay, scroll, 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 scroll. Do I have any experience with the shit Ragnarok? No, only it meets. Um, it sounded good at meets, so, but I never evaluated it recently. Um, so, okay, again, asking me questions. There's a whole bunch of stuff mentioned I've never heard. Um, speaking of the Pro IDSD, how good is its headphone amp? It's pretty good. Um, it's not as punchy as the Pro ICANN, but the Pro ICANN loses resolution. Uh, for like Utopias, it's really fine. I mean, you get the most resolution out of the the, the it'll it'll power Susvaras. It won't do as good as like a bigger amp will do, obviously. Um, uh, but you know, it's like if you didn't compare, you wouldn't you wouldn't care. Um, it's at least as good as the R twenty eight amp. I didn't haven't compared directly. Um, I probably should actually try plugging it into something like the R twenty eight or actually R two simply the um, NFB one amp and comparing it and then finding out where it stands. And I'll probably do that for the final review. I'm just waiting to be talking to them about the final firmware with MQA, which I don't like, but I will still review. Um, and so then I'll compare the headphone amp, how it stands. So, I mean, you can do better, but if you're a direct device, actually for most headphones, if they don't have like special requirements or especially if you want to use IEMs, um, then actually the, the, the built-in amp in the Pro IDSD is pretty good. Uh, so, if you're using anything less than Utopias, I just stick with a built-in amp. Um, next question. So, we're going to have to skip the Ragnarok. Um, 
Okay, so I was looking for a portable setup for my phone. I have two models in mind, the Odyssey Sign with lightning cable um, or a high-end Bluetooth headphone. Ah, that is a good question. Um, I haven't tried the Sign except the prototype years ago. Uh, I wonder how isolating it is. So the, the problem with portability is no matter how nice the headphones, if they aren't isolating, you're going to it's like... The noise coming in for me, like say on a train or something, kind of ruined the music more than anything, uh, more than the fact of say noise cancelling would. Actually, what I thought what I'd do is get in the new um, uh, Sony's and try them. But now I think for preference, like if I'm on a plane or something, I'm floating around here still. Yeah, I'll actually just use noise cancelling headphones because um, uh, it's just you know drowning out, actually cutting out the out background noise is more important now. And especially the technology is so good that cutting that out is more important than having you know, like a pair of high-end IEMs or something with me. Um, although, like uh, the I, so a lot of the IEMs I have, like if I use triple flange tips or something like that, will cut out quite a bit of sound. Um, I think it's just less hassle to have like a pair of headphones. It's like, oh, I've arrived at my destination. I'll just y I can yank off a cup or something and and hear what's going on around me, which I often need to do. Um, so, or like I'm on an airplane, it's like, okay, I've got custom IEMs in. I'm relaxing. The the flight attendant comes up it's like hold on a sec while I un get this out it's like oh whoosh, off and it auto cuts out and it auto shuts off and that's easier so I think for hassle wise and portability I think now I just buy uh, noise cancelling headphones and because the sound quality is just you know you can nitpick the sound quality but I think I'd, the fact that I have nice music I can listen to and I can listen to it well is more important to me than you know oh maybe the treble's a little bit bright or the, the bass is a bit too strong kind of factor that you get sometimes with some of these cans um Ah, uh, uh, wire moved it. Okay, so maybe it was the iPad was too close to the mic. Um, excellent. It's probably something like the power. I try and keep everything power separated. Like there's there's power bricks all under the table, and you know, everything's on um, uh, cable. Was it cable mate or there's this um, company that makes these things that bolt onto your desk where you strap all your cables to it. Anyway, did I get your audio or does he Mobius yet? Not yet. Um, yeah, I did buy it. I actually want to use it, so if I, an occasional time I do listen to movies, I can get that experience or do game a bit, um, which is not not often. Um, I actually wanted that specifically, so. Uh, will I get the Hugo TT2 for evaluation? I hope so. I've got a contact cord. I think everyone and their dog wants to evaluate these in the industry, so I don't know if I'd ever get hold of one uh, in a hurry. So, And I don't like asking for stuff like too far ahead of time that I can review it. Um, yeah, good old critical IEMs for portability. So we're pretty much almost done. Unfortunately, I have, because of uh, rain cancelling appointment yesterday, I have an appointment today. So last questions. So, and hopefully next time we won't have this disaster with the uh, with the camera and I'll, I'll set up OBS uh, on the other computer a little bit better. The other computer, which is, fan is screaming with um, trying to redo everything. I don't still don't know why the stream size is all screwed up, but anyway. YouTube says my stream. It, YouTube says I'm sending out 1092 by 614. Your guess is as good as mine. Um, and then the, yeah, anyway, so. Uh, if you get the eye sign, the cipher cable makes a big difference. I did hear the first cipher cables and they were, they were quite impressive for what they do. Uh, and then the amps, you know, amps they had, they did better, but you know, for, for uh, I think the idea was certainly a good one. Like the uh, originally, like the sign headphones and the cable was actually pretty cool. Um, and uh, it was interesting just thinking back to the Odyssey factory and how much Odyssey was really interesting actually. What is not in the interview is how much are they do things themselves. Like, let's say they want to make uh, you know headphone driver. They won't go and okay, we're going to buy all this expensive equipment and, and make headphone drivers. They make everything in house. Uh, they repurpose stuff and reprogram equipment to do what they want to do. And so if they want to make like a rig for assembling headphone drivers, they will actually hand build the rig themselves and then hand build these rigs. So everything, there's a lot of photos that are not in there, which I took um, and I would have had to have gotten approval for. So I only took like ones which were, didn't show anyone anything that might be, uh, uh, they might not like. Uh, you know, sometimes you take factory workers pictures, they don't want their faces shown or they don't, if there's stuff on monitors, they might not want shown like frequency response curves or 
uh, certain rigs you weren't allowed to take photos of. So it's kind of, uh, but they had a lot of stuff in there. I remember in the factory, which they, they had, reper had bought secondhand and repurposed or uh, um, that kind of thing. Actually, a cool story, not about um, headphones. I'll tell a cool story about uh, Mitsubishi. So Mitsubishi in Australia is now gone, unfortunately. And they had one pitch when they, to save themselves. Uh, their last ditch attempt to save themselves before they uh, were shit canned by the head company, and they made what's called the uh, the um, the th the uh, 380. I think I can't remember what if it had a letter in front of the name of the 380, and it was a 3.8 liter full size Mitsubishi. Um, unfortunately, it was the terrible terrible timing uh, because this is back maybe it's over 15 years ago now, about 15 years ago. And there's terrible, terrible timing as there was a kind of fuel crisis and fuel was going up and it's big cars were not the thing, which was very, very crappy timing. Anyway, they wanted to they, they wanted to mold this thing in sections to make it simpler to you know build and assemble. So like the whole like the side panels of the car were like these single molds. Actually, for it was a very well built car. It was this, one of the most solid large cars I've driven, and they needed this particular molding machine, and it literally got down to the wire where these Factory workers were searching eBay for the machines and they bought one from overseas. I think it was like on eBay or something. I'm not kidding you. This is building a, a brand new car model and they were actually hunting for, sec they're actually hunting for secondhand equipment to do it, uh, to actually build the car. And they pulled it off and I test drove one. It was one of the nicest cars I test drove, uh, you know, for a, for a basic big car. It was just really solid. And so we're literally panel molding using secondhand equipment bought off eBay. I kid you not, it's absolutely true story. And um, and still, unfortunately, you know, timing and everything, the company got shit canned. And uh, so now, if you're okay, if you ever go to Australia, you may or may not find a Mitsubishi 380. I don't know if they were decent cars if they held up over time, but I think the bodywork was pretty solid. Uh, assume hopefully, if the paintwork was solid, the bodywork would be solid because it didn't rust, for example. <laughs> I don't know. I have to be interested to check the history of that. Talk to my car mates about it. But it's a pretty funny thing about manufacturing, about repurposing stuff. You wouldn't think a car manufacturer would do that, but that's how down the wire it got down in the, down in southern Australia. So, but now the you know, Australian car industry is gone, so it's kind of dead. So, anyway, I thought it was a cool story. Um, so, last questions: How big sound station Edition X V2? I haven't got the Edition X V2 here. Um, can you recommend the liar with the HD eight hundred S? I haven't got the H800S here. It seems to be a good amp. It, it drove so far as well. Really, it actually, uh, you'll see, I'm gonna, the audio valve Solaris, the, the big tube amp, which was sitting there, is gonna, the review will come out as soon as I take a couple more photos and put them in the video. And uh, the, it was clipping on high, it was kind of like starting to break up on high volume and the Lear, Lear, Lear Liar 2 would not, it would reach the same volumes with that complete stability. So I don't see why not, why it wouldn't work with an HD800S. I mean, if you like the HD800S, I thought it was a pretty clean, uh, so far it's a pretty clean sounding amp. I mean, if the stock tube is even, they've included a decent stock tube. Uh, in other words, not electroharmonics, which is less decent, but actually uh, a tongue sole reproduction, uh, modern reproduction, which is act which actually nice. It's a basic tube. I've got a, like a, I found a Sylvania chrome top for 17 bucks or so. Uh, they're normally around 50 bucks. I think they've got cheaper actually. The chrome tops have suddenly gone down in price, but um, the chrome tops were really expensive. It was a nice smooth tube. So it actually it's a nice, fairly smooth amp. So I think if you like the H800S, I don't see why it would be a problem. It actually is a, a, a nice all round amp. Um, it's, uh, you know, with, it's definitely up their game, especially since the stock tube is decent. So um, it's, I can tell you now, it's a good amp. It's, um, there's no, it's, it's gonna be like, it has an input, it has a, a preamp output, it, it has a single tube. It seems to power everything fine. Buy it. If it's in your market to buy it, buy it. I haven't tried the deck card. I'm not going to um, buy it in a, in a uh, Mimbi or Bimbi or whatever. And, you know, that's a good rig. Um, and that's my thought. That's like the entire, re that's like the entire review. The rest is just, you know, you know, introduction and all that. So <laughs> that's it. It's like, if you're thinking about the Lyre 3, it's in your market. You've got a basic basic DAC, yes. Um, what's your, your opinion on the best HP under $1,000? Oh, no, well, there's no best. Um, here's a thought that came up with yesterday. Um, there's a guy we're talking to uh, who has a subwoofer in his hi-fi system. He doesn't switch it on always. 
Um, we were talking about like subwoofers because we're talking about speakers a bit. Um, and uh, my thought is if you're, let's say you're a speaker person, if you always are using your subwoofer, then uh, you'd like something like Sony's or Cascades, uh, the Campfire Cascades. If you're the kind of person who'd never use a subwoofer, then you probably like uh, neutral sounding cans like a Sundara, Eonflow, Eonflow Open. Uh, what else have I forgotten? Focal LX, that kind of thing. So um, it depends on the music you like. If uh, the LX is kind of brighter and less bass, so that can be like, if you like more modern music, that can be a bit, bit too bright for some people. The Eons can be tuned because you can make them sound a little bit darker or a little bit less dark. Uh, like I like them with the black inserts. Uh, they can be good, but they kind of tend to lack dynamics a little bit. I think the, uh, like the Focal is a little more kind of, like dynamics by mean, like when you have like a drum hit, it should be, you know, if you've been in front of a set of drum set, drum, drums in your, in your life, you'll know exactly what, you know, percussion is like super powerful, super strong. And, you know, almost nothing reproduces that except, you know, like large horn speaker systems or, you know, stupid, stupidly expensive um, hi-fi. Uh, it's just really hard to reproduce. And the dynamic, I mean, like how fast the, the, the impact of, of um, instruments and music and, and how much, you know, kind of sound depth you get from the small sounds to the big sounds and how fast they can deliver that without, like, uh, with clarity. So um, I think for some reason there's been discussion of, like, a... Uh, the planar wall, where the planar headphones tend to have a bit of a wall of um, uh, kind of damp the dynamics somewhat for various reasons, and it's kind of hard to get over. Anyway, it's something that probably requires a technical discussion. But so that's the only kind of downside of the, the Eon speakers, Eon headphones, which I've got to get back in actually to uh, for gear comparisons. Okay, last questions because I've got to go. Um, Focal clear of the HE500. I haven't got the H never had the HE500 here. My Sundara review is closest to it. Um, yeah, I returned the Focal Clear. I returned it because of price and it ruined my taste in my HD 500. Yeah, that's that can happen. Um, okay, again, the Lear 3, I told about headphones easier. No, Lear 3 doesn't kill headphones. People kill their headphones by not understanding tube amps. So I'll do it once again. Okay, so this is my Lear 3. Okay, let's just assume I've been listening to music and I want to change a tube. Instruction, this is how to do it correctly. Everyone who hasn't done it correctly killed their headphones. So, um, okay, I'm going to change a tube. Turn the volume down to zero. Unplug your headphones. Switch off the amp. Wait two minutes. Get in the glove, or whatever you're going to use, and then gently pull out the tube, which I can do here because this is switched off already. Okay, when you're putting in your new tube, check now. Six S and sevens, you can't. There are the pins. There are all pins in all sockets. So, check very carefully that the notch is not damaged. Because if it is damaged, there's a small chance that you might slip it in the wrong way and blow things up. Check very carefully where the notch angle has to go, and visually line it up and make sure it's sitting in there, ready to go in and make sure it's all the way in. Then switch on your amp and check that it, the heater lights up. Otherwise, then you'll know the voltages should be going in the correct place. Then plug in your headphones. People who blew up their headphones, probably hot swapped tubes or didn't switch the, turn the volume down then try to replug tubes while it was still hot and there's still voltage in there and then something surged and blew a voice coil. Um, no, it does not blow up headphones. People blow up their headphones. And this is a start 10 years ago, people were instructing like, when you're changing tubes, follow these guidelines. And it doesn't matter what protections they put in the amp, you've got to follow these guidelines. So, um, uh, and the, the thing is, like if you have a cheap tube amp, it usually might not dump enough voltage in there for something like, for that kind of mistake to kill the headphones. But the Lear 3, Lear 3, however you pronounce it, is you know a much more powerful amp and if you had something like the volume at max and the headphones still plugged in and you, even if you'd switched it off and pulled the tube out maybe it, you got a power uh, a surge a spike through the through there and it killed the headphones so do not break those rules so that's what happened i missed your question oh my god hold on give me a sec um that means i'll have to find it you might have to repost it if the chat's too long but i will Find it somehow. Okay. 
did, was it posted? Where, where did you post it? If you repost it, uh, if, you, if I missed a question, then I will, it might've got buried in, in um, all the questions I got in different places. So um, I have to go though, but I will answer your question online later. You can always ask me directly. Um, will I be having more Discord invites? Uh, maybe. So that's going to have to be, okay. Oh, I'll answer Spring Bay's question and then I'm going to have to go. So Fio FH5, what is your take? Um, what do they sound like? Crap with foams are great with balanced silicon tips. Uh, well, you're changing it. You're changing nozzle shape and, and construction. So that affects the, um, you know, how the sound passes through. So it's like dynamic, you have a dynamic driver and balanced armatures and balanced armatures, in my experience, and Critical is probably going to tell me more, know more about this and probably going to tell me where I'm going wrong in this, is that uh, balanced armatures seem to be somewhat less affected by the, you know, the nozzle shape. Whereas dynamic drivers, you know, you narrow the nozzle, you get kind of less treble, more bass. Whereas you widen it, uh, widen the nozzle tips, you get less bass. You lose bass impact. Like if you use spiral dots, which have a very wide nozzle, uh, then you lose bass impact a lot with with uh, a lot of IEMs. So dynamic driver IEMs. So to keep that, it's just the, the nature of, uh, so the FH5 has both balanced armature and uh, uh, dynamic driver in there, and that'll be very much more sensitive to the uh, effect of tips. So it's kind of like, you know, after the sound comes out, how the, the nozzle is shaped will affect how air goes through. I mean, if you want to have some fun, look up jet engines. There's a guy in Canada who tests jet engines and he posts the tests online, but you actually can see things like the afterburner nozzles and stuff like that. And there's actually used that science is actually not really that different to how sound passes through um, a pair of IEMs. Anyway, um, so what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to go. Uh, sorry that I can't stay longer, but thank you once again, everyone. Uh, congratulations, Space Robot, for, for winning a little prize. And um, see you in the, uh, well, more videos coming out in the coming days. And then otherwise, I'll see you in uh, next month's stream. And uh, what I'll do, keep the chat going for a little bit and then I'll, uh, I'll post some invites if you want to join the Discord. Okay.